They slipped from the electric light and charged activity of the trenches into the quiet night, the distant fires casting a weak, hazy glow across the landscape. Near and far were hard to distinguish in the gloom, a mixed blessing as they crept from the trenches and began their quiet approach towards the front. Minnie racked her brain in the silence, keenly aware that every footstep brought them closer to that moment when she would be expected to identify the enemy for the two sharpshooters ahead of her. A wave of sick dread passed over her, and she didn't have the energy to resist it. This was not where she was supposed to be, nor what she was supposed to be doing. She should be well on her way to the Order Outpost ten miles north. She should be camping for the night in the shadow of a boulder, or among the roots of some leafless tree halfway there already, and looking forward to a couple of hot meals, a clean bed, and a dame de lac to repair her arrows, not simply hoping to survive the night. She'd done her job for these men. She'd killed the vampire and told them as much as she knew about ghouls. And while hunting rogue sorcerers had long been the province of the Order, this was different. This wasn't some necromancer stirring up trouble in a quiet, rural town. This was war, and these sorcerers were now soldiers, combatants, and she wasn't supposed to be dealing with them directly. She was simply meant to clean up their mess, or make it harder for them to make one in the first place. It wasn't a perfect system, but it was what allowed the Order to help in what limited capacity it could, the only way to keep this war from becoming something far nastier. What if her actions here changed that? No, it wouldn't do to tie herself up in knots about that now. Because, in a horrible flash of knowing, she realized there only was now. Later was so far ahead of her, with so many possible twists and turns and dead ends to her story, that it was futile to try to predict any outcome. Later might as well not exist, it was so far away. Later was impossible to picture, while she crept through the night, favoring her left leg, under a sky painted red with smoke and fire, and the enemy prepared to descend upon them, and unleash a horde of dead things eager to swarm over everything living, like maggots over a ripe corpse. Dead things. Corpses. Sorcery. Just like that, the idea formed. I know what we need to do, Minnie announced in a loud whisper. The two men ahead of her drew up short, waiting expectantly for her to continue. Minnie scanned the hazy horizon. She thought it might be... There. The copse of trees. Follow me, she said, and took the lead. The dark tangle of trees grew larger, taller, more opaque as they neared. It looked more menacing to Minnie now than it had 24 hours ago when the vampire had pursued her there, however that was possible. The light of the fires was weaker at this distance, only strong enough to trace the line of trees marking its boundaries. Does anybody have any matches? Minnie asked. They couldn't use flashlights. They'd be spotted for sure. But if she could find the tree in the clearing she had been in earlier she could find what she needed by the meager light of a match's flame. Both Swift and Briggs silently pulled out books, but they wouldn't chance using any until they found the right place. If Minnie had learned anything in her travels across the countryside by night, it was that it was surprising how far one could see light, even something as faint as a candle's flame, in the darkness. Until then, they would move through cover of darkness and rely on the pale, ruddy light reflecting off the smoke clouds above to guide them. That would have to be enough. The undergrowth was minimal, a blessing since there weren't any branches or dead bramble vines to tangle their feet and stall their progress. Still, it took longer than many would have liked, though her sense of the passage of time had become truly muddled. Had it been thirty minutes since they left the trenches? An hour? Three? Surely it couldn't have been too long. The Germans wouldn't wait any more than they had to before pressing their advantage. If anything was keeping them at bay, it was their own sorcerer's work 
the ghouls had to be rendered inert, and many suspected that required a ritual in itself. She had no idea how much time that would buy them, let alone how much was left. Abruptly, the trees opened up, and the dull overhead light dropped down to the open ground, making it a map of vague orange light and deep black shadows. The solitary tree in the clearing stood tall and silent, almost watchful. A shiver shook its way up Minnie's spine, and she looked away, holding her hand out for a book of matches. She burned through eight before she found the body. It laid heavy where she left it, headless, splayed out, skin a stark white with an undertone of sickly green to it. Behind her, she could hear Briggs swear under his breath. Christ, he whispered. You did this? Minnie only nodded. She passed the matchbook back to Swift, who crouched and lit another match as she drew the dagger sheathed at her hip. If you Yankee women are this tough, I can only imagine what the men are like, Briggs said. She couldn't tell if his tone was odd or disturbed. Probably both. If they were as tough, they'd be over here already, she said. With a decisive swipe of the blade, she severed the fingers from the corpse's left hand. Briggs hissed. Swift watched impassively as Minnie plucked the severed index finger from the rest before cutting a thin strip from the bottom of the soldier's dirty uniform shirt. You have what you need? Swift asked. Minnie slid the dagger back into its sheath and stared at the items in her hand. The finger was cold and hard, with mud caked under its fingernail and around the cuticle. The idea she'd had earlier was there in the forefront of her mind, gaining more clarity, but she couldn't speak. Not while she stared at that long, tapered finger resting on her palm that had belonged to a vampire, and before that, a man only newly grown from a boy. A boy whose body had been desecrated and destroyed a thousand times by war and necromancy, and twice more by her own hand. Mustering her resolve, she forced herself to look at Swift. The match burned down, throwing pools of black shadows over his bruised face before it sputtered out, and she was once again only staring at a vague shape against a blood-red sky. Yes, just need to get close enough now. The hardest part, just the hardest part left. They left the grove and prowled through the trees and darkness, a new tension thickening between them. The boom and crackle of mortar rounds, so similar and yet so different from thunder, had started up again from their side. The German front seemed quiet. Between rumbles and bursts, an owl hooted. In the undergrowth, Minnie spied the brief flash of green circles in yellow eyes. Upon leaving the relative safety of the trees, they dropped their hands and knees. Barbed wire rose up in a thicket, spreading ominously before them. They stopped just short of the tangled mess once the copse was a quarter mile behind them and the forward enemy trench another quarter ahead. The enemy trenches were lit up like they had never been before. With the British battalion so near, they'd never dared to light much more than a carefully concealed cook fire, but now there was no need for discretion. Figures moved up and down the line, and orders, muffled by distance and incomprehensible to non-German speakers, were being shouted with great excitement. The push was imminent. In the trenches that had once been theirs, there was movement too. The ghouls still roamed, not yet put to ground. Minnie's heart leapt. Good. There was still time then. Swift and Briggs split their attention between watching her and glancing at the activity along the German line. Minnie swallowed hard, opened her hand, and tied the strip of cloth from the vampire soldier's uniform around the severed finger. Propped up on her elbows, she let it dangle from her hand, like a spider at the end of its single silk thread. She'd been thinking on the words to say to have the effect she wanted. Magic, when it worked, 
was a strange alignment of the user's intention and its own natural principles, which were only vaguely known and poorly understood. While anyone could theoretically cast spells, that was no guarantee this would work. She might not be in the right state of mind, might not have the focus to make her will upon the world. These elements, the finger and the strip of uniform, might not be enough material or have the right connection to make the working work. There were a dozen ways it could fail. Even if it did do something, it might not be the right something. Hodge, scryer that he was, would have been much better suited to this mission. But Hodge was dead in the trenches behind them, and Swift and Briggs were counting on her here. The battalion was counting on her. Hell, the whole damn war effort might be counting on her to get this right. She gestured for them to come closer, and with her free hand unbuttoned the top of her coat and reached into a padded inner pocket for a vial. It was a small metal tube stoppered with an eyedropper carrying one of a knight's most essential tools, optical oil. An alchemical concoction made by the Order using a highly secret formula, it allowed anyone who used it to temporarily see magical energies. If they could have gotten any closer to the German lines, they might not need it for what must come next. But they were already frighteningly close as it was. Minnie gestured for one of them to open it. Briggs took charge of the task. She pantomimed putting a drop in his eye, and he did. Instantly, his face screwed up into a silent grimace. As he swiped at his eyes and mouthed a slew of impressively creative curses, Minnie passed the vial to Swift. Even bracing himself, his reaction was a mirror to Briggs's. Minnie didn't blame them. Optical oil stung. It scarcely mattered that she'd used it a dozen times before. She still winced when she put a drop in her own eye. When her vision cleared, Swift and Briggs were no longer watching her or the German line. They were staring back at their own trenches. And good God, a moment later she understood why. The German lines, surprisingly, didn't seem to be all that magically active at the moment. There were vague shimmers of magic here and there, leftovers from previous, older casting work. But from the British trench, magic flowed, blacker than midnight and nearly opaque with potency. It boiled up from the trench depths and frothed over onto no man's land, drifting across the broken, festering ground like a vile fog. No wonder her bracelet had burned her wrist when it tried to absorb all that power. She'd never seen magic so dense or so caustic. All the more reason to get to work on her own little spell, and pray that it did indeed work. Minnie sucked a deep breath in between her teeth and closed her eyes. To the rancid night air, she whispered, Telling finger, telling told, were they young or were they old? Were they tall or were they short? Were they of an evil sort? Telling finger, point for me, to the one who made you be. Telling finger, help me see, who did make you evilly? She repeated it again. Telling finger, it was a simple spell, bordering on childish, but she was too inexperienced to attempt anything more sophisticated. There was a reason old spells were often spoken in rhyme. It had a focusing, trance-inducing effect, no matter how silly the words might sound, or how silly she felt saying them, especially with the marshalling enemy troops before them and the swarm of ghouls behind them and the barbed wire and bodies around them, and... Her eyes sprang open, and she stared at the pale, severed finger hanging limply from its tether. Nothing sparked the air around it. No hint of magic stirred the string. The finger was dead, inert, and useless. Still, she murmured the words, tears she didn't know she had, springing hot into her eyes. Help me see. Who then did Swift make laid you a hand flee? on her shoulder and joined his voice to hers. Telling, telling finger, telling, telling told. told. And on her other side, Briggs touched her arm and solemnly began reciting, Were they young or were they old? Were they tall or were they short? 
were they, they of an, an evil, evil sort. sort. On its pendulum of soiled cloth, the finger slowly began to spin. Telling finger, finger point, point for, for me, me to the, the one, one who made you be. Faster it spun, hints of silver sparkling in the air, winking in and out of sight like light across a diamond's facets. Telling finger, finger help me see. see. At her back, a warm wind rose, and all the hairs along the nape of Minnie's neck and her arms raised in one abrupt wave. A damp smell sprang up and cloyed in her nose as a white mist started to seep from the muddy, broken earth. The witching was working. Along the German lines, she heard an uptick in activity. Someone shouted an alarm. Who Who did did make make you you evilly? The fingers suddenly stopped spinning and pointed ahead. A tight beam of silver, invisible but for the optical oil, sprang out across the landscape from its fingertip and connected with its target. The sorcerer was moving down the line, and the finger tracked their progress unerringly. Swift and Briggs stopped chanting, but the spell was going now, and Minnie held it, her will enough to fuel it alone. They nodded to each other, lurched to their feet above the thickening mist, and snapped their rifles into the crooks of their shoulders, taking quick aim. Two shots rang out. At least one found its mark. The silver cord of magic connecting the vampire's finger to its maker snapped and dissolved. But, Minnie realized belatedly, magic still gathered in the air. Swift and Briggs had already hit the ground when an answering volley of shots cracked across the night sky. Minnie dropped the finger into the earth and pressed herself flatter, eyes wide and searching. Along the horizon, two gouts of bright, shifting red energy shot into the air and gained menace by the second. Two signatures of two workers weaving spells. Two sorcerers, where once there had been three. They'd shot the one that had made the vampire that stalked Minnie by morning's light, but the telling finger had not shown them the two that had not had a hand in its making. God have mercy. She had thought that maybe by this point she'd be beyond feeling fear. Her brain should be numb, overloaded from the events of the last few hours, but it wasn't. Terror pulsed under her ribcage as she watched the scarlet plumes begin to fan out, sending seeking fingers of their own to grasp and find and hold and rend. We can't stay here! she yelled. Overhead, bullets still pelted the air. We can't run either! Briggs countered, eyeing the red wheels against the black sky with rising panic of his own. We'll get blown full of holes! Swift tapped Minnie's shoulder. His face was calm, expressionless. He pointed behind them. Minnie turned. The mist that was whispering across the ground around them here was a heavy curtain behind them, only getting thicker. With the sheen of optical oil still slicking one eye, she could just detect that it was ever so softly glowing. And there, darting out from its leading edge, was inexplicably, impossibly, A small black creature. A cat. A cat with bright golden eyes. A cat that was looking straight at her with its bright golden eyes, like it knew exactly where she'd be before it even emerged from the mist. Which didn't make any sense at all. But the world wasn't a very sensible place after all. Having caught her eye, the cat turned, lashed its tail, and sprang into the fog bank, disappearing. Follow me, it seemed to say. Minnie didn't think twice. She began to crawl, flying her way as fast as she could along the ground. Then, when she felt the burning touch of magic at her neck, she jumped to her feet and ran. A sharp, painful twinge shot up her leg from her ankle, and she cried out. Once again, Swift was at her side, steadying her, dragging her into the fog bank, with Briggs close at their heels. As soon as they entered the fog bank, the sounds of the front became muffled, as if it were leagues away. They limped along, panting, with no way of knowing where they were heading 
only that they were leaving the madness behind. Until the cat reappeared. It sprinted out from the uniform white and winded its way around Minnie's legs. Hello, puss, Briggs said, his voice muted. The danger of the situation had leached out of them. It seemed to Minnie the front was a lifetime away, now that she couldn't hear the roar of war or see the stark, bare horror of it. The fog was impenetrable, cool without being cold, safe as houses. She leaned down to run her hand through the black cat's fur, but it skittered away from her and sat just beyond her reach. It never took its eyes off her, nor did it make a sound. Beneath her feet, a tremor shuddered along the ground. No, not a tremor. A steady beat. A rolling series of thuds growing louder. Swift stiffened at her side. Horses! He exclaimed. Before they could make sense of it, the riders were upon them, bursting from the eerie, fathomless depths of the fog. The horses snorted and whickered, dancing around them, foamy sweat streaking their withers and flanks. Four riders in all, swathed in dark traveling cloaks. They thrust their hands out to their little trio. One pulled Briggs up onto their horse. Another, a white-haired woman with bright gray eyes, dismounted and silently passed her reins to Swift. Minnie watched as she turned and walked toward the front, the black cat following in her tread. My dancing! A voice shouted urgently. She turned to see a man on a powerful bay stallion leaning down, his hand outstretched. We must go! Now! But where was the woman going? Minnie glanced behind her, tracking the woman's fading form as it melted into the mist. Now! Dazed, Minnie offered him her hand. He hoisted her up on the horse behind him and immediately wheeled his mount around. Put these in your ears! He commanded passing her a couple of pale wax plugs, the same kind that blocked his own ears. Her fingers were cold and covered in dirt. They shook as she pressed the first plug into her ear. Before she could get the second one in, the man spurred the stallion's sides. It leapt forward with a squeal, jumping instantly into a gallop. Minnie lost her grip on the second ball of wax. It fell to the ground lost as the horse surged along, throwing clods of earth up behind it. Squeezing her unexpected savior tight around the middle, Minnie craned her neck around, hoping to catch sight of the woman they were leaving behind. The air grew heavy, squeezing, and the same sharp prickle that had raised the hairs on her neck before returned with greater intensity. Somewhere close to the front, a pulse of light brightened the fog and pushed it back. The woman's receding form stood at its center, her feet rooted to the earth, her hands outspread. Light gathered around her palms, growing so brilliant they resembled two stars in the night. The dark form of the cat sat quietly at her feet. The rider in front of her cursed, spurred the stallion harder, urging it faster, but the poor deer was already going as fast as it possibly could. In the distance, the woman brought her shining hands together in a clap. The remaining fog blasted away, revealing the Germans pouring out from their trench, their sorcerers calling the ghouls from the abandoned British side up onto no man's land, all heading straight for the lone woman. Without exception, they all fell in a rippling wave, knocked from their feet into the mud, struck by something Minnie couldn't see. Before she could puzzle out what had happened, the air compressed further. A deep rumble broke into a single booming crack, and the sky split above Minnie. Then everything dissolved to velvet black.